Our climate is changing. The choices we make affect the amount of greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere. Making a few changes around your home and yard can cut carbon emissions and even save you money. Swap out five of your most used light bulbs with Energy Star bulbs like CFLs or LEDs. Change air filters regularly and make sure you maintain your heating and air conditioning systems. Recycle newspapers, beverage bottles, and food containers. Compost your food and yard waste to reduce the trash you send to the landfill. Recycling conserves energy used to manufacture and dispose of these products, which cuts down on greenhouse gas emissions. Turn off the water while brushing your teeth and fix leaky toilets and faucets. It takes a lot of energy to pump, treat, and heat water, so don't waste it. I decided for personal reasons not to attend COP26 this year. However, in two recent interviews with European journalists and on a panel this week at the Caribbean Renewable Energy Forum, I was asked to reflect on the progress that had been made since COP21 in 2015. I responded that it was heartening to see 1.5 degrees Celsius now accepted and referenced in all news reports as the long-term temperature goal. When we went to COP21, very few people outside of the Alliance of Small Island States thought there was any chance of seeing 1.5 degrees Celsius in the text of the Paris Agreement. When the final text of the agreement came out, an Article 2A contained the words holding the increase in the global temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels we were told that we had pulled off a negotiating miracle. I remember the then European Commissioner for Energy and Climate Action saying to me, just before the High Ambition Coalition made its triumphant entry into the plenary room at Le Bourget, where sometime later Laura Fabius would gavel the Paris Agreement into existence, Fletcher, you and your small islands have pulled off a coup. So today, six years later, to see that 1.5 degrees Celsius is the only goal that is spoken about, is very encouraging. However, sad to say, this is where the good news ends. The walk has not matched the talk. Every year since 2015 has brought new, bad climate records. We have continued to pump more carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, the so-called greenhouse gases, into our atmosphere. Global land and sea temperatures have continued their relentless increase. Ice melt at our North Pole is taking place at an alarming rate, exceeding the predictions of the desktop models. Our oceans are becoming more acidic because they are being forced to absorb more carbon dioxide. Droughts and deadly forest fires are becoming commonplace in some parts of the world. Frequent flooding is destroying lives and livelihoods in others. And the impacts of climate change on health, food security, water security, and economic stability are becoming more severe. Since the adoption of the Paris Agreement in December 2015, the G20 countries have provided more than 3.3 trillion US dollars in subsidies for fossil fuels, the same fossil fuels they have promised to phase out to allow us to get to the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in January of last year, Governments in G20 countries have committed at least 238.4 billion US dollars to oil and gas and another 46.5 billion US dollars to coal. In other words, while small island developing states and other climate vulnerable countries have been fighting to keep their populations alive and their economies afloat during the COVID-19 pandemic, the rich industrialized nations have pumped 275 billion US dollars in subsidies for fossil fuels. So I hope you can forgive my pessimism when I say the walk is not matching the talk. The recent assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change painted a very scary picture for our planet. It showed that in all but one of the scenarios, we would exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature goal. That report showed that while the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal was still reachable, it would take commitments, 
and actions on a scale we have not seen so far. The Emissions Gap Report of the United Nations Environment Program, which was released earlier this week, shows that the existing pledges in Nationally Determined Contributions, or NDCs, which are the reporting instruments used by the countries that signed on to the Paris Agreement, will get us to no better than a 2.7 degrees Celsius increase. When we factor in the net zero pledges that have been made recently, many of which are not anchored in legislation, we can shave an additional 0.5 degrees Celsius off the expected long-term warming. In other words, the best effect of the NDCs and net zero pledges that are currently on the table will be global warming of 2.2 degrees Celsius. While some would like us to believe that that is progress, it is not what we need. Far from it. For small island developing states, global warming is not an academic discussion about gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents. It is an existential issue. Each fraction of a degree over 1.5 degrees Celsius will cause serious impacts for us. Loss of biodiversity, sea level rise that will inundate coastal communities, more days of extreme heat, longer periods of severe drought, stronger hurricanes, and greater likelihood of bushfires, to name but a few. Our planet is a living system, which itself sustains other living systems. A fever in a human being is a sign of illness, and if left untreated, it can lead to organ damage and death of the individual. Our planet is no different. If this global fever is allowed to continue unabated, species will become extinct, ecosystems will be seriously threatened, and the environment in which human beings live will become more unbearable and treacherous. The climate change impacts will take an immense toll on our economies, which are already reeling from the devastating effects of COVID-19. We are currently struggling to keep our national economies afloat. When Hurricane Maria struck Dominica, it caused damage equivalent to 226% of that country's GDP. Hurricane Irma caused destruction that exceeded 300% of the GDP of the British Virgin Islands. Climate change will cause more of these severe hurricanes. For developing countries to adapt to the myriad devastating impacts of climate change, the United Nations Environment Program has estimated that they will need 70 billion US dollars annually right now, which will increase to between US 140 and 300 billion dollars annually in 2030, and between 280 and 500 billion US dollars annually in 2050. When you add the cost of responding to irreversible loss and damage from extreme weather events, sea level rise, ocean acidification, the estimate for the cost of our response in this decade approximates 1 trillion US dollars. Now, as large as this figure sounds, it is less than one third of what the developed countries have paid out in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry since the adoption of the Paris Agreement six years ago. Developed countries made a pledge to mobilize 100 billion US dollars annually in climate finance for developing countries by 2020. While they have reported providing an average of 59.5 billion US dollars per year in climate finance, Oxfam has shown that when loan repayments, interest, and other forms of overreporting are removed, the true value of the financial support may be as little as between 19 and 22.5 billion US dollars per year. To add insult to injury, 80% of all reported public climate finance was provided as loans. In other words, we, the countries that are the victims of a climate catastrophe we did not cause, are being asked to borrow money from the same countries that caused the crisis in order for us to respond to the crisis. Even more egregiously, Oxfam estimated that only 3% of the climate finance that was disbursed has been disbursed to small island developing states. The window for taking action to reduce the impacts of climate change and to restrict global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius is closing quickly. Unfortunately, many of the countries that are in a position to keep 1.5 alive have shown weak ambition to do so. Moreover, the levels of climate finance that are needed to help the victims of climate change adapt and strengthen the resilience of their societies and economies are not forthcoming from the developed countries. A recent report by the BBC 
revealed that some of the major greenhouse gas emitting countries have been lobbying the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to water down the conclusions of its last assessment report to minimize the need to transition away from fossil fuels and the importance of making finance available to developing countries. COP26 cannot be another COP of pledges and commitments. It cannot be another talk COP. COP26 must be a COP of bold, ambitious action at a scale we have not seen before. It must be the walk COP. Our CIS negotiators have a proud history of being the most committed, knowledgeable, and indefatigable team of negotiators at COPS. They routinely punch well above their, their weight and achieve outcomes that belie the size of their delegations and the resources at their disposal. Once again, they have a tough uphill fight on their hands. In whatever way we can, we need to rally to their cause and give them the support that they will need to fight for small island developing states. We need to amplify our voices for climate action and for climate justice. The survival of our citizens, our brothers and our sisters depends on it. This really is a life and death issue. Grenada is a paradise in peril. The ocean and the tropical weather that sustain it, weaponized by climate change, touching every aspect of life here. Telescope Bay is on the east of the island, a community being forced out by the encroaching sea. Makeshift defenses, not enough to hold it back. There is no more choice. I have to find somewhere else to put this house. Patricia Richards has been here for three decades, but it's time to leave. I feel angry because I know it's, it's humans that cause climate change. We human did, we did all the wrong things. Because right now the sea is up on us and it keep on coming. And there is no stop in it. And it's not just at sea level. More intense rains are destabilizing the soil, sending homes and businesses tumbling down the hillsides. All of this will need to be rebuilt. Elsewhere, they move a road away from a river that constantly floods, part of a huge effort to protect people from the effects of climate change that are already here. On this island alone, that's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. That's way more than it can afford. And it's a story that's playing out on climate vulnerable nations across the world. That's where Simon Steele comes in. He is Grenada's climate minister and an increasingly powerful voice amongst a coalition of dozens of island nations demanding a massive influx of cash to help them adapt. Survival is such a base term. Mm. I want more for my children than just to survive. I want more for my people. I want more for myself than just to survive. We need to be able to, th to thrive. The COP26 climate summit in Glasgow is now just days away. For many, a last chance to secure what is needed. I think it's make or break. Entire nations will be underwater. You know, what price, what price do you put on the lives of people? What price do you put on our culture, our right to exist. It is a warning and a plea to the world, one that the people of this island hope is heeded as they cope with change they did not cause. Do you worry about the future? Yeah. The amount of fish we used to catch, you don't see this amount of fish anymore. It's difficult for us as farmers now to cope. We cannot really plan because we don't know when is the rainy season, when is the dry season now, simply because climate has changed. 
during this past year, we've lost two crops back to back. That can affect you financially. It can affect you emotionally, mentally, physically. As world leaders prepare to make decisions that will shape the future of our planet, Grenada is a symbol of a looming David and Goliath-style battle for funding, one that vulnerable nations are increasingly determined to win. and we have to protect these things and there are simple simple steps that we could take to actually protect ourselves in the Caribbean from climate change. I think climate change is actually very serious and we're not taking it as seriously as we need to because by doing that we're making a big mistake that we won't be able to change in a little bit of time. It's a lot less time than we thought we had before and we need to do something about that now. I think it's like awful like what we are experiencing, especially now, like a lot of glaciers are melting that they've never seen before, or increasing maximum temperatures and also increasing minimum temperatures. And I feel like, as a human race, because we played a part in, um, you know, climate change, we should also play a part in like trying to fix that. I think climate change is bad because um, it's already doing so much damage, and then after we are adding a lot more pollution on it it's making it even worse and the air i mean it may seem clean but it's actually very musty and we have to take a lot more care of our environment about education i would talk to it like implement it in school and try to educate as many young children as we can so that they could one understand what climate change is because a lot of students don't know what climate change is um, and ways that they can um, substitute things in order to benefit our climate and hopefully, you know, um, renew it. It's more like electric cars. Like in the future, I feel like it should be all electric cars so that there's no more, you know, major pollution. We got uh, companies that are still using fossil fuels that can switch over to electric, but it's more money. So, yeah. Uh, pollution, really, yeah. And the animals, they can't, you know, survive in their natural environment. Um, I feel like we're burning a lot of fossil fuel that we don't really need. And, yeah. Global warming. You know, the ice caps are melting. Yeah, air pollution in New York, like, when you go to other places, you can see stars at night. One of the biggest issues that we have in the Virgin Islands, and I think in the Caribbean, is garbage disposal, like um, plastics plastic bottles, you know, when people finish drinking plastic bottles, they want to throw it on the ground. The same way with bottles. Just teach it in school so that people grow up knowing um, that they can change. Little small steps, you know, that will help us in the long run, will help the next generation to be more eco-friendly, to, you know, stop so much waste, you know what I mean? Students, especially at a younger age, should be more informed about sargas and seaweed and what it's doing to the environment and how we can make use of it instead of just letting it be around and also just more informed about pollution and different things that would make an impact on our environment especially here in the Caribbean because we have a direct influence to the sea and all the ecosystems in the ocean so if we were to educate younger children they would grow up to know as adults that this is important and we need to take care of this not to instill fear in them or anything, but just to bring about the awareness that will create a change. I think climate change is one of the most dangerous threats we face uh, together as a global community. Um, I know in 2050, like we're going to have to wear special face masks because of just of the air quality created by all these carbon footprints and carbon emission. And I know a lot of us right now are suffering having to live through masks. So I can't even imagine how we're going to be in 2050 when we can't even walk outside without having to check the air quality. It's a good idea to bring about that. Um, 
that idea for students to learn about it and stuff? I'm very worried, you know, because so many of the, the beautiful like um, traits of the world that we love are not going to be the same anymore. And because we keep ruining them for capitalist objectives that are very temporary and very small-minded, very myopic for only the 1% of the people who live there. Um, so yeah, I think we need to be taking it very, very seriously. I believe it's real, it's happening as we speak. And people need to be more mindful because only the people can Bye -bye. fix it because the people are the ones who created it. I think a lot of people are, which is very grateful, but I think a lot of these large corporations, it can't be just be the people who are using paper straws instead of plastic straws. It has to be the big corporations who are leaving these um, remarkable footprints on our planet and they need to start taking accountability and really thinking about what they're doing to our children. Like, let's say they have turtles all around us and we and we throw plastic bags, it can choke them and we won't have any more turtles to like meat and things. Everybody's talking about climate change. Nothing has been done. All the rivers are getting clogged. The, the, the garbage, the plastic is going into the water. The fishes are eating it. The fishes are dying. The birds are dying. Well, it's been affecting and I see a lot of difference happening from the time that I was... I had understanding and I was born. I think there's a lot we could be doing to, you know, help the... A lot more we could be doing, especially since it's getting hot and everybody feeling it. We have an island where you have sunshine, you have wind, but yet still you hardly see any solar panel on any house. I see a lot of difference in even the ocean because I'm a fisherman and I see lots of difference in the ocean. Even that the tide is coming up, up, up and higher. The education system has to put an emphasis on environmental issues. Because like Gavin said, it's real um, and the people are causing it. Even if the earth is our home, it's not ours, we still have to take care of it. It's not something we can just make use of and leave. We have to protect the earth and make sure that we're being respectful with the home that we have because we don't have a second option. I think that needs to be taught in schools. I think that's the first step because these kids are going to be going into majors and they're going to have this understanding of climate change and being able to apply their studies into the real world and that's what it's really all about. That's what we lack. We don't really have anything to bring out the creativity in the youth here. Climate change is bad because we don't take care of the atmosphere. So if you're not taking care of it and you're adding more harmful things to it, it'll get even worse. Climate change is bad because, like we've said earlier, that causes a lot of damage to the environment. And especially right now, most of us are not taking care of the environment like we should. But they should have more activity so that we could actually get into it and enjoy it and learn a bit more about it. I think that we should be able to be in the environment a bit more often than you should and stay in the classrooms and we should get more time to actually feel and be in it to realize what it actually does. What I really want the Prime Minister to do right now is to give more education for free. You don't have to pay anything for any education. Education mom. When world leaders meet next week in Glasgow for the Conference of Parties 26, the Caribbean will not only have a seat at the table, but also a voice demanding action. Ahead of the summit, Ryan Beachu had the opportunity to sit down with the United Nations Global Ambassador for Climate Change. Climate change has arrived. Can we start by agreeing on that? Absolutely. Raquel Moses will fly to Glasgow this week for the most important meeting of her career. Among the world leaders that will travel to Scotland's largest city are U.S. President Joe Biden, French President Emmanuel Macron, and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Moses will be the voice of the Caribbean, recently appointed United Nations Global Ambassador for Climate Change. Moses' advocacy for small island states like those in the Caribbean could prove pivotal. What case do you intend to make on behalf of the people of the Caribbean in Glasgow? Certainly that we are incredibly vulnerable but we are innovative and ready to con deliver solutions to the world. 
that we need the funding and much of that needs to be free money because if we're talking about additional loans, we just don't have the debt capacity to take on additional debt to solve a problem that we didn't cause. The challenge for countries like Trinidad and Tobago that are energy exporters is that decisions taken here have far-reaching consequences around the world. Cutting CO2 emissions directly means cutting into industries that are most important to our economy. This is one of the reasons why Moses will tell world leaders in early November the Caribbean needs money. The challenge that we have is that a lot of that money is not free money, it's loans or even equity investments. And those are all great, but we also need access to free money because again, we don't have enough room to take on any additional debt. The Caribbean's clock may be ticking faster than other places. The seas are beginning to reclaim land on the perimeter of small islands. We, we're definitely seeing sea level rise across the region. It's not, you know, you're, you're, hearing, the, you're hearing people talk about, oh, well, with 1.5 degrees, you're going to see this much sea level rise. Sea level rise is happening now. Erosion of the coastal areas is happening now. People are having to, being forced to move across the region now these things are all happening already. Moses labels it the point of no return, making Glasgow make or break, do or die. We're on the wrong trajectory, but until and unless we remain hopeful and determined and action-oriented on measuring the changes that need to take place, we won't get there. So I refuse to believe that anything but Positivity will come out of Glasgow because there is not another option. Already thousands are marching ahead of the conference, amplifying the message the world is running out of time. Ryan Beachu, CNC3 News.